An ordinary man, insurance executive, 45 years old, stumbles to his death on a subway platform in New York City. Or does he? Unbeknownst to his wife or child, his brain is rescued from the accident scene by a secret branch of the United States government and put into the body of an artificially produced 26-year-old man who has the strength of Superman, the speed of Michael Jordan, and the grace of Fred Astaire. The only catch, on the penalty of death, he can never let anyone from his past know he is still alive. And that, my friends, is a problem. For this man is desperately in love with his wife, his daughter, and his former life. I was living in New York, and I was making movies. I had just finished a movie with Jennifer Aniston. And I got a phone call from Les Moonves, and he said, uh, would you like to go to breakfast? So we went to breakfast, and he said, you should be doing television. You haven't done television in a decade, and, uh, you know, Moonlighting was an amazing show, and you, and you should come back and do television. And I said, I have a secret for you. I said, if I came back and did television, everybody would understand that I was actually a fake and a fluke. The moonlight, there's no way you're going to get me back to do television. It's just not going to happen. And he said, I'll make you a proposition. He said, write any pilot you want, any pilot at all. And if I don't make it, I'll pay you, and I'm not going to embarrass him or myself. But it was an obscene amount of money. And I thought, well, he must very badly want me to do television. So I said, great. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it was kind of a, kind of a no-brainer. I didn't have to run the idea by anybody. I didn't have to do any of the stuff that makes pilot making so, so difficult. So I went home and started to think about what I'd like to do. And I remember being very influenced by an old musical called Damn Yankees. And the premise of Damn Yankees is it's about a guy who, who loves baseball and, and I want to say he lives in Seattle and they have a team that never wins and he makes a deal with the devil, literally makes a deal with the devil where he's turned into a young man so he can go play for the Seattle team and turn them into a great baseball team. But what he discovers, having made this deal, being this young man who becomes a big baseball star is that what he really misses and where he really wants to be is back in his house with his wife who's 25 years older than he is and I, I just I, I always found that a terrifically romantic idea so I started playing around with that about a guy who who was ripped away from his family and is given something presumably we'd all want which is to say youth and and you know great strength and great speed and all this stuff but what he really yearns for is to be back with his family and that's really where now and again uh comes from honey i'm gonna be around for a while right you're stuck with me for life you think so huh i know so mm. no it again I've always been turned on by taking disparate genres and trying to put them together. So the idea of doing what is essentially a romance and melding it with science fiction and then melding that with sort of spy drama, I thought, oh, I wonder how this will work. The bridge went down. People died. We're the insurers. We have to pay. It's not a judgment call. Act of God. Act of God. Act of God. Bad steel is not an act of God. It's an act of negligence. What if it had been your wife or your kid in one of those cars? Don't tell me about wives and kids. I am always thinking about my wife and kid. That's why when I got on that stand, I said, act of God. And if you had been thinking about your wife and kid, you would have done the same thing. And right now, you would be sitting in that corner office instead of that cocky kid. So I wrote this thing. I really didn't talk to anybody because the deal I had made with Les was, I mean, it was, a, it was a, an onerous amount of money they would have to pay me if they didn't make it. So of course they said, well, let's make it. Les didn't know what it was, I think. What is this? You know, it's all mixed up. And so, but at the same time, he very much, the, CBS was very much a network at that time, sort of trying to reestablish itself. And I think he was very excited about the idea of announcing that the guy who did Moonlighting was going to do another show for them, so he, he said he announced that we were going to do the show, but he put it on Friday nights at 9 o'clock after Candid Camera, which was just not a great slot. And I understood that it, was, it wasn't a show you could point to and say, oh, this is a show like that show. And so in, in that way, it represented a risk. It wasn't a star vehicle. 
you know, although they were all great people, there, there was no one in the show who, who had fronted a, a successful show. So I, I was grateful that we were on the air. And, and he had lived up to his word, so it wasn't, you know, was a, you know, the only thing was, you know, it would have been nice to have a, a, a cushier slot. But they, frankly, there weren't a lot of cushy slots on CBS at that time. I'm lonely. I miss everybody. I'd spent, a, boy, eight years or, or more in the Star Trek universe. I, you know, I started my career on, on Star Trek The Next Generation. I did three seasons of that, and then I did five seasons of Deep Space Nine. And, uh, you know, it was, I, I felt like it was time to move on, and um, I declined to stay with the franchise and work on, on Voyager, which was a, you know, a, a nice offer to, to have. And I was sort of regrouping and trying to decide what to do next. Uh, and I got a call from Steve Stark, an executive of Paramount, who said, you know, there's a show um, I think you might be right for. I want you to watch this pilot. It looks like it's going to get picked up. Um, it's by the creator of Moonlighting, which was obviously very intriguing. It was a groundbreaking show. Um, and, and this was his first return to television after having made some, some really great features. Um, and so I was very intrigued. and, and um, Steve sent me the uh, a secret copy to watch, and you know, and that's how I got involved. I mean, I, I was it, it was such an original um, hour of television. I'd never seen anything quite like it. Deep, deep down, I just can't make myself believe that he's gone. There's no body in the grave, nothing to say goodbye to at the funeral home. It's like he went to work one morning and then just didn't come home. So why clean up his office? Why empty out his things? He's coming back. He's just lost or late or... After I saw the pilot, um, I called Steve and I said, you know, I'm interested, you know, uh, I, I, you know I, should meet, I should meet Glenn. And um, he said, well, he's going to be out here for this or for that, but, you know, he lives in New York, he lives in Connecticut. Um, and, uh, but I'll tell him you're interested and We'll see, we'll see what happens. You know, he'll probably want to read you. You know, read, read a sample script of yours, or, or you know, or something, or talk to people about you. That's how it's usually done. And then, uh, and then we'll set up a meeting if he's interested. And I got a call the next day saying, uh, "You got the job." And I said, "Oh, okay. He, he doesn't want he doesn't want to meet me first. He's like, "Nope. Just just be in New York on you know May 17th." I show up in in Queens, and 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 you know, I get my office and I get a desk and I meet the other writers. Glenn, you know, not only wrote the script for now and again, he, he directed the pilot. Um, and, you know, there's a, there's a, he's a real auteur, you know. Uh, I know that sounds like, it's a pretentious word, but, it, but it's very true in his case. You know, Glenn is, is, is very unique in the television business um, because, you know, he, ha he brings so much more experience than your typical writer. You're watching me, aren't you? All the time. No. Oh, great. So I can just walk out. It's been a difficult first week for all of us. I guess I'm not making myself clear. What I'm trying to tell you is that I no longer wish to participate. I just... I just want my life. Or rather, my death back, please. It doesn't work that way. This wasn't a trial offer, Mr. Wiseman. It was a, 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 very, a big change for me. I was used to working in a writer's room. Frankly, I've never been a room guy. I've never, I didn't even understand that there was such a thing. I would, we would just sort of get together and figure stuff out and then split apart and then write and kind of collide again. And um, it was very informal. He did things very differently. Um, he, he appreciates the value of a writer's room but he has no patience for it himself. <laughs> he doesn't want to be in there. Um, you know, the magic for him happens alone at his desk uh, at six o'clock in the morning. You know, Glenn Karen was the first one there and the last one to leave. Where's the uh, Barca lounger and the big screen TV? <laughs> you know, it's going to take a lot of work to maintain your new body. You won't have a lot of time for lounging and television. There's a thing that happens with a showrunner. Who, especially someone who's created the show, the show, you have to live and breathe it. 
and, and only you truly understand it. And here was this pilot. One of the things that was so unique about it was that it was a cliffhanger. It literally ended with to be continued. I didn't think that was such a radical idea, but apparently it was. But then I didn't think it was a radical idea to end season one with to be continued because I was, and this will give you some insight into my personality, I was certain we were coming back. That wasn't done in television at the time. Um, you know, uh, stories were always closed-ended. Pilots really, you know, the belief was pilots really needed to just tell you what the show was going to be. And here was a pilot that didn't at all tell you what it was going to be. In some ways, it was the first reel of a feature. Um, and, you know, I remember we were all just walking around going, so, you know, so, so what's it going to be? Glenn was trying to get sets built, designed and built. He was trying to hire you know, costume designers and, and hire a DP and, you know, put together a production. I'm writing, I'm editing, I'm casting, I'm producing, I'm to talk, trying to talk to the network and trying to talk to the studio. And all of that's happening simultaneously. So I have a sense of panic and it's very real, but I don't have a lot of time to indulge it. I think it's worse, weirdly, for writers because a certain amount of their time is, is, is solitary simply by dint of what they do. Um, Whereas I, I didn't have the, this will sound snotty, but I didn't have the luxury of that. And I was also directing, so it was, you know, it was really kind of, you know, it was crazy. And then he, here he had this handful of writers who were always, you know, hey, do you have a minute to, you know, of course, of course, of course, of course, we'll have a meeting for first thing tomorrow morning. And, and somehow something would come up and we would have maybe 15, uh, 15 minutes of a meeting and then, you know, Something would come up that he'd have to go do. I'll be back in a minute and three hours later, and you know, he wouldn't come. You know, um, and the reality that we came to understand is that he didn't. He, he didn't want to answer. He couldn't answer because he didn't quite know yet. I think we were kind of all expecting that there. That there, the first thing that was going to happen is we were going to get hour two of the pilot, but uh, but Glenn hadn't hadn't written it yet. He hadn't finished it yet, and he didn't want anyone to see it until he was done. So you know, for that reason, he was sort of avoiding the writing staff. And then at some point we were like, okay, all right, well this is, you know, okay, well let's let's all, let's all get together and talk about what the show might be. I need your help. I don't have any money and I need to see Lisa. Lisa Wiseman and Heather, will you take me to see them? The Wisemans? What do you want with them? What are you gonna do to them? I'm not, I'm not gonna do anything to them. I just, I just need to see them. I really need to know they're okay. You are a really good friend of Michael's, I know that. So was I. He wants you to take me. What, you, you spoke to him? Sure. Recently? I see. We kick stuff around and we put things on a board on the wall and hoping to maybe give, you know, get a chance to pitch it to Glenn. And, but he was very elusive. <laughs> he, he would come in and say, well, that, that sounds interesting, or gee, I don't get that at all, or, or uh, okay, hang on a second, I gotta go. And you know, he's trying to find time to write and, and, and to get down to the set and make sure it's being, you know, it looks the way he wants it to look. Because you know, again, he, he, he's a filmmaker. You know, now he's not just a writer, he's a filmmaker. I mean, you seem like a genuinely nice fellow, and I, I don't know what your particular circumstances are, but it's obvious that you need help. Somewhere in this in this process, you know, Glenn said, you know, it's just, it's it's becoming, um, it's becoming so big, I actually think it's a three-parter. And we were like, okay, well, well can we, 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 I don't want you to read the second part until I finish the third part. And now it wasn't, he wasn't just putting us off, he was putting the studio and the network off. Uh, and saying, I, I'll get it to you when it's finished. This was extraordinary, you know, and here he was pushing off the, the, the studio and we're weeks, a few weeks away from shooting. We're not really working on other, other scripts yet. No one could pull this off, you know, unless they had the credibility that he brought to the table, you know, because of the success and, and, the, and the groundbreaking nature of, of Moonlighting, you know, and because Paramount and CBS were so, you know, excited to have him, you know, in their, in their stable. Glenn especially gave them something that was uncompromising. I mean, it really was when you think about it. There are very few creators or writers who could have done that concept, taking somebody's brain, and this body has been you know, created by the government. It sounds absurd, and it sounds like it could be completely over the top. It just was like amazing. It, it just felt so real and, uh, and so uh, character driven, and it sparkled. And I don't think anybody else, there aren't many people that could have done that.
It was Glenn speaking. Michael Angeli, who's a wonderful writer, he would come in with these provocative premises, provocative images. My agent, you know, uh, calls me and says, there's this guy, Glenn Gordon Karen, who really wants to hire you for the show now and again. And he had read all of my articles. I, I was a journalist before. I wrote for Esquire for like eight years, and I wrote for Movie Line for uh, another four, and he had read like all this stuff, so he's a huge fan. And he called my agents and he says, is Michelangelo interested in like maybe writing for a television show? And uh, so they got in touch with me, and Glenn actually called and, you know, introduced himself, and I said, wow, I'm really, really flattered, you know, but we, I have this pilot, so I'm waiting to see if it's going to go. So I, I can't, I don't, I'm really sorry. And he said, you know what? I'm going to give you two episodes. It's like, you write two episodes, you know, in L.A. while you're waiting to see if your pilot's going to go. And I'm like, wow, great. He said, but if your pilot doesn't go, you got to come out. you got to come to New York. you got to work on the show. And I said, deal. And, of course, the pilot di didn't go. So I came to New York. But the thing is, for the two episodes that I wrote uh, back in L.A., it meant that I had to go to New York and sort of break the story with the, in the, in the so-called writer's room. And that's where I met Renee. He said, all right, well, so uh, what are you thinking? What do you want to write? And, and I gave him this image of this woman climbing this tower. I remember once he was talking about a radio antenna, you know, this big, gigantic, and they're, they're anachronistic now. And I thought, Oh, wow, that's a great way to start an episode, climbing a radio antenna. I pitched that idea, and he's like, all right, you're going to write that. I said, okay, I, I don't have an entire story. He said, you will. You'll have a story. Go back. Go, go, in, go in this office here and think for a while. So that's kind of the way it worked. We would throw out things and ideas and, and stuff like that. It was sort of very loosey-goosey that way. At one point, I managed to stop Glenn as he was getting coffee or something, say, hey, I, re I really want to you know, pitch this to you or talk to you about this. or you know, and, and it was probably the third or fourth time this happened. Then he said, yeah, that sounds interesting. That doesn't. And, 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 you know, and he said, listen, I, I can't do it right now. And I said, I just, I just need five minutes of your time and we can figure this out. And he looked at me and he said, Renee, if you think we can figure this out in five minutes, don't you think the audience can? And he walked off. <laughs> and it's, it was the first time I, I came to understand that what made Glenn tick more than anything was the element of surprise. He felt, and I, and I, I you know, I worked with him, I want to point out, I worked with him not just on, on Now and Again, which was only a season, but I went on years later, a few years later, to work with him on Medium, and we did, we did five episodes of that show together, five, five years of Medium, we did 100 episodes. So I came to know him very well, and obviously he's been a mentor to me, um, and I learned a lot from him. And, and I learned, I, I, what I learned in that moment about him was that the element of surprise was the most important thing to him. Once things started to sound familiar, that you go, oh yeah, then this can happen, this can, once he goes, what well, it's familiar, he would say to us, because you've seen it before. I was constantly saying to them, our job is to startle. That in a world where there are all these choices, because even back then in 1999, there were, there were numerous choices of things to watch. To me, the, the great challenge is you, there's so much literature, by literature I mean so much film and television and stuff, we've all seen so much of it, that very often we sit down we start to watch something, whether it's a movie or a television show, and we go, oh, okay, I know what this is. And that, I know what this is, subconsciously helps you make the decision, am I gonna sit here, or am I gonna sit here? And I felt that we needed to get the audience to sit here, and that the way to do that was whenever we saw a recognizable paradigm or a predictable paradigm or something that came from film or television as opposed to life that we needed to throw it away walk away from it as quickly as possible and say no 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 what's the truth now that that sounds ludicrous in a, in a show about a guy whose body's reinvented to talk about the truth but I, by the way i had the same rap on moonlighting i mean it, which you know it was an absurdist show but, you know, and they would come to me and they'd say, where are the pages? And I'd go, I, I'm waiting for the truth. And I mean, it's, it's really pretentious and obnoxious to say that. But it was honestly what I felt and what I still feel is you wait for the truth and the truth will always startle you. The truth will always startle you because the truth of life is, life is unpredictable. That's one of the amazing things about it. You, you, you start out having a great day and then it turns awful. You start out having an awful day and then it turns miraculous. Um, and so you try as much as possible to sort of get that quality into the plotting and into the, uh, into the writing and then into the acting, and, and you hope somebody else cares. 
Uh, but that's always been a real touchstone for me. So that, that sounds like something obnoxious, I would say, to Rene. <laughs> he was figuring it out as he went. And he did that on purpose because that's the only way he could surprise himself. Tell me about my funeral. What would you like to know? You know how in the movies it's always raining? Your funeral, the bluest sky, this lovely faint breeze. Your wife didn't wear black, she wore orange. Oh, I love that dress. There's a drug I can give you that we believe will effectively erase memory. Memory, not learning. You stay just as bright as you are. I don't understand. My memory? That's all I've got. Okay. It's just a thought. We were waiting for the second hour, you know, of the pilot to be written, or maybe it was the third, and finally, you know, we got some something, or maybe we got a few a few pay, acts, you know, television is divided into acts, we call them, you know, where the commercial breaks fall, and um, Michael was finally going to go out and take on the Eggman, and he was going to be released, you know, there was a certain amount of trust there, and this, there was this moment of, of okay, I'm going to trust you, um, you know, Theo says, and you're going to do this, right? And he lets him out of this town car. And what's, what he said in the script was that he slipped on a mask, you know, like a, like a Lone Ranger type mask. And we were like, oh, okay, wait, so he's, so he's going to wear a costume when he goes on missions. Okay, this, okay, all right, we all had to sort of had to get our head around this. And we said, so, and Glenn, was, Glenn had this way of, of, of um, giving you pages and standing there watching you while you read it. <laughs> <laughs> Just, you know, and, and waiting to see where you laughed or where you didn't. And, you know, it, it could be a little unnerving at times, but, but um, you know, and it was also an opportunity to, to share with him and to bond with him. And, and it was, you know, it, frankly, it was a privilege to be the one he asked, hey, would you read this? You know, because he was saying he, he really valued your, your input. And I remember reading this and saying, okay, so, so he's going to wear masks, he's, he's going to wear a costume, and Glenn just kind of looks at me, sees, sees my reaction, he kind of squints, and he goes, nah. <laughs> he takes the pages and walks away. <laughs> I am going to tell you everything I know about this business of faith, but I'm just telling you up front, I don't know a whole lot. So if I let you down, just save it and wait till you're older and I'm gone and you're seeing a shrink, okay? <laughs> Deal? All right. Faith is believing in someone or something when absolutely all the evidence tells you, shouts at you that it just ain't so. Like? Like God. Like goodness. Like there was an angel in your hospital room. So you believe me? Sorry. I'm sorry that I wasn't right there for you the first time you told me. It's okay. Because I get it, Heather. I really get it. Sometimes, even though it makes no sense, I still feel like your dad is here with me. Like now? You're trying to crawl inside someone's head and figure out what their vision is. Um, and that was my first experience with that, with, with someone, you know, fortunately, as hugely talented as Glenn. Well, I figured it out. My anniversary. My anniversary's coming. It, it may even be over already, but I know it's right around this time of year, right around now. So, come on, Doc, what's the date? Mr. Wiseman, what's the difference? The difference is... I'm asking. It's called a favor. People sometimes do them for each other. No, I'm sorry. Nothing good can come from it. Says you. 
says anyone who's thought it through, the reason there are no calendars here, the reason you are denied television, telephone, newspapers, magazines, and radio, is so that you could focus your attention on your work. No. No. I, I'm not going to tell you the date. It was hard for him to make decisions because once you made, once you make a decision in a story, all the other things that might be start to fall away. You know, you're you're open, you're you're slamming doors. You know, and it's starting to funnel towards something. Um, and uh, you know, it's hard to do. Okay, it's hard to do 22 episodes of television in a row with a process like that. I don't want you memorializing special events, birthdays, least of all your anniversary. For goodness sake, it's not even really your anniversary anymore. I see. I see. So I can help you tell you what to say to your lady friend, and you that's know the okay. Rules. Well, you need a favor from me. I'm right there. Mr. Wiseman. But I say to you, tell me the friggin' date. It's not the same thing. Why? Because you're dead. And dead men don't have anniversaries. Because dead men don't have wives, they have widows. And I think he really succeeded with that one again. I mean, it truly was an original. Because it was just romantic and funny and, and unpredictable. Give me a sign.